think that was pretty beautiful that he offered to do that, and I think he did a really good job with it. So thank you, Mike. So finally, tonight uh, is our main speaker. It's my great pleasure to introduce my friend, uh, a National Geographic explorer, Ronan Donovan. Ronan's love of the natural world was born, as he was, in rural Vermont in a cabin his folks built. Ronan inherited a healthy sense of curiosity and wanderlust from his parents, who, after crossing the Atlantic in a 35-foot sailboat, chose to raise their two boys close to the natural world in the forest of New England. A wildlife biologist turned photographer, Ronan's inquisitiveness for the natural world and his obsession with learning about our fellow social mammals has led him to all seven continents. He's had malaria three times, that's three more than me, hiked volcanoes to photograph mountain gorillas, I've not done that, spent a year in Africa's equatorial jungle researching chimpanzees, lived a year inside Yellowstone National Park documenting the lives of gray wolves, and recently, as of, oh, I think two and a half weeks ago, he returned from the high Arctic where he was spending the summer filming a pack of wild, wild Arctic wolves for the series Planet Earth. So let's give him a round of applause as he comes on in. Good evening, everyone. How y'all doing? Thanks for coming out tonight. Appreciate it. We're just switching over computers here, getting all set up. Yep, that looks good, guys. Great. Um, what I thought we would do tonight is talk about wolves and two different locations where wolves live, one being near here in the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem, and then contrasting that to wolves that live in the high Arctic on a place called Ellesmere Island in Canada's most northern land mass. It's just to the west of Greenland. Same species of wolf, just different subspecies, but they behave in very different ways, and they allow for a very different experience, I guess, as somebody who tries to document and photograph their lives. So we'll jump right in here with uh, a little personal connection to, to wolves. This is um, my brother, Eamon, and this is his wolf-dog hybrid named Willem. And so Willem lived to be the ripe age of 11. He was a, a good dog in, in all the ways, um, but he's, he was different than, than domesticated dogs that have been bred for hundreds of years. Willem was two-thirds timber wolf, so kind of Great Lakes type of wolf and he was very smart. And it's one of the differences that is marked in research between dogs and wolves or wolf hybrids, especially in that wolves and wolf hybrids in captivity, they could see and then do. So they could see a caretaker open a fence, a gate or something like that, and then they could just do it. Whereas dogs needed to repeat this task over and over again, then they could eventually do it. But it was the seeing and doing. And so Willem, his trick used to be in my brother's truck, my brother works construction and um, could bring Willem with him all the time, but in his truck, Willem figured out very quickly that he could open the door. And so if he didn't want to be in the truck anymore, he would just show up. My sister-in-law tells a story where she's in CVS in the pharmacy getting prescription, and all of a sudden hears people like, whoa, there's a wolf, like starts like yelling around, everyone's worried. He let himself in through the electric doors and is just pacing through CVS trying to find his person, trying to find Marissa. So my brother figured that out. Okay, he had to like shove these screwdrivers or like these blocks of wood in the door handles so that Willem couldn't open it when he would leave. So then Willem quickly figured out that he could simply just sit in the driver's seat and honk the horn. <laughs> and that, that was enough to get attention, of course. Everyone would come inspecting what's going on. Sounds like a car alarm going off. So that was kind of my first, I guess, introduction to, to wolves and, and some wolf behavior. And what I want to reference is that kind of the domestication. This is a process that has happened many times over the last you know, 10 to 20,000 years. There's some evidence that wolves potentially, the domestication of wolves in Europe and Asia helped humans outcompete Neanderthals, which is a fascinating read. There's a, a book called Invaders that talks about that. But it's this idea that humans on the landscape, hunter-gatherer communities saw this animal, they hunted the same foods, they'd be in the same locations, live in similar family groups, and somehow figured out that this was a useful animal to have around. And if you think about it, 
just having you know, a wolf that came close to camp or near kind of your scrap pile or your, you know, your meat pile that you discarded food, if that animal just barked or chuffed or bark howled when something came by, that would be useful in itself just to have around, just a little security blanket to have nearby. And then we now use wolves for many different things, guarding, herding, um, you know, protection of both livestock and people, service dogs, all kinds of things, dozens of different breeds that have really specific uses. And before I went to this place in the Arctic, where you'll see what the wolves are like there and how unafraid they are, I thought domesticating wolves must have been one of the hardest things to do because I've only seen wolves in Yellowstone where they're very shy, they're very scared. But as you'll see, um, when wolves have no fear of people, they, they come right up. And the biggest issue there is that they just, they wanna steal your stuff. <laughs> they wanna play games, they wanna play keep away, they wanna come in, put a camera or a bag on the ground, they're gonna come grab it, and then you gotta play the chase game. But just a quick overview of wolves in North America. You know, they used to exist all through north to south, coast to coast, from you know, Mexico all the way up into Alaska. Um, and now we have wolves that have been reintroduced as everyone's aware of, I'm sure, in Yellowstone. We're about the 25 year anniversary of that. And wolves around here, this is an image I took in Yellowstone and this is kind of representative of, of most of the encounters that I've had with wolves. They're very kind of fleeting glimpses, very intense. There's a very kind of wide-eyed gaze here. These wolves are on a carcass feeding in Yellowstone along the Yellowstone River, but they're not fully relaxed. You know, wide-eyed, um, looking around, kind of a little bit nervous. They obviously know that I'm there, but they're still coming to feed. And wolves were eradicated from this area um, and most of the lower 48 simply because they competed for the same things that we eat, cattle and then wild game as well. And so they were extirpated and then they've been slowly kind of making a resurgence, but just really based on how much um, tolerance there is for them, how much human tolerance there is for them. Wolves can do really well in the landscape, but it's just a matter of how much space they're given. And again, this is, you know, not to put anything against ranching, um, it's one of the most, you know, profound ways now in the West that we can conserve land and conserve especially land and habitat for wildlife when it's done in, in specific ways. But it's just, it's, it is still the issue that exists with wolves is that they compete for the same thing that we do. And Yellowstone wasn't created for wildlife, uh, wasn't created in the idea of having habitat. It was created for the geothermal features. So these, these things that we come to love about Yellowstone um, is the hot springs and the thermals, and the borders were just drawn because of that. Um, and so now with animals that move in and out of Yellowstone, we know that because of collared animals. Um, this is a, a collaring operation that goes on in Yellowstone every year um, with wolves. This is a helicopter biologist named Doug Smith is hanging out with a, a dart gun. He's tranquilizing this animal. Um, yeah, that's looking back at the helicopter. But now they know with the borders of Yellowstone, animals move in and out of the park, and the park itself, two million acres, isn't enough to sustain all of the animals inside the park. It needs 20,000 acres, sorry, 20 million acres that incorporates the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Three different states, many different land ownerships, private, public, a whole bunch of mosaics of federal and, and private land. So when you have these wolves down, they, they uh, take all the samples, put on collars. These are being fitted with GPS collars. Um, and these are other members of, of Doug Smith's um, Yellowstone Wolf Project. Um, this was an article from National Geographic, I think it was in 2010, um, that references kind of the, the change to the ecosystem. When you bring back the wolf, the animal that is the co-evolved predator of elk. You know, we wouldn't have elk as the interesting animal that we like to hunt or that we like to see in the landscape if wolves didn't exist. Um, the elk was essentially made by wolves in that co-evolution. And so you bring those animals back, and this is just kind of an illustration of the riparian, riverbed, streams, all the habitat that is brought back when you change the way that the elk behave in the landscape. It's not always necessarily bringing elk numbers down, which of course wolves do, but it's also in just changing the way those animals move through the landscape, this idea of a, a landscape of fear that the elk and, and other prey animals don't wanna just hang out lazily 
in certain parts of the landscape, like these river bottoms. So in Yellowstone, I had to use camera traps, which are you know, game camera traps or, or trail cameras that people use in hunting all the time. Um, these are kind of a little, a little more uh, robust, a little more kind of you know, putting a, a big camera here, like what we have down the front row, where it's, it's a big professional camera. Sometimes you use lights, sometimes you use flash. You're putting it in a waterproof housing, and you're taking these images. But again, these images that I'm showing you from Yellowstone, you know, this is a, a moment. This is a, a wolf that is feeding on this carcass again in the river. But there wasn't much behavior, right? It's, it's a single image. It's a single wolf. Wolves are social mammals like we are, and they have so many more elements to their behavior, physicality, um, the worry that they have when they're separated from each other, the rejoice that they have, the reunions, these pack rallies that you see, all the pup rearing that goes on. I didn't see any of that in Yellowstone. And this was a year and a half trying to photograph wolves for a National Geographic magazine story, and I think I got two pictures that I was happy with. But still, they didn't really show the behavior, right? So I knew there was a place um, in the Arctic from this cover of National Geographic Magazine. This is in the late 80s. Photographer Jim Brandenburg took this photo. And there was this place where wolves seemingly weren't hunted. They didn't have any competition. They didn't have any reason to fear humans. And I came out of the Yellowstone Project feeling like I, I hadn't really shown wolves for for how they really are, hadn't really shown much of their behavior. Again, it was just kind of these single moments with these wide-eyed wolves that are kind of scared, and they you know, exhibit that back to the viewer. They, it, it's a very intensive gaze, and that's often how, even still when I'm out and I see wolves in the wild, they're in close proximity, maybe a few hundred feet or something like that, if I'm hiking or hunting, they're generally scared, and they exhibit that kind of that fear look. And so I wanted to figure out and wanted to see and understand wolves kind of without the, the human element, without the persecution, without the fear, see what they were like as these wild animals. And so I convinced National Geographic uh, to send me up. This was in 2018. And I spent three months on this place, this Ellesmere Island. And it's this very interesting tundra landscape. There's no, no plant over you know, this tall. There's like willows that grow on the ground like a vine, and they can be maybe as thick as my finger, but a few hundred years old because they grow so slowly. And this place is, again, as I mentioned, furthest northern landmass in Canada. This is just to give you a little bit of context here. Um, the place I spent all the time is, is here, this place called the Fosheim Peninsula. And what's unique and interesting about this peninsula is that you see all around there's all this kind of white these ice caps. This is permanent ice caps, um, you know, a mile thick of ice. And what that ice does, those mountains do, is they buffer that kind of center peninsula here from all the really nasty Arctic storms. And so that peninsula is kind of called the Garden of the Arctic. It's this place where maybe a hundred wolves live total, um, a few thousand musk oxen, and are distributed throughout that peninsula. And what you do there, instead of setting up a camera trap, is you just lay on the ground. And this is what I'm doing here. These wolves are just walking past me after spending you know, a month of time with them, and they kind of got to know me and understood all the sounds and all the things and all the smells and everything that comes with a human trying to keep up with wolves on a four-wheeler with all this equipment. And so they become fearless. They become curious, and that's kind of their default, is they check things out that are interesting on the landscape. Anything that you know, looks different to them, sounds different, smells different, they're gonna go check it out, why not? And so up there, you get this window into their lives that in Yellowstone, there's, I mean, there's no way I could do this, make this picture in Yellowstone. This is actually a camera trap image. Uh, I felt that it was a little too sensitive to be at the den when this was happening with this little six week old pup. So this was um, set up with a camera trap, but. Camera traps in Yellowstone, they're scared of human things, so they wouldn't really come near it. I set this one up, the big male came by, he peed on it, and then it was okay. And then it was like just a rock on the landscape, they didn't care about it. And so for you know, four or five days, they were able to get all these really unique, interesting images and video of this little single pup, there was only one pup, um, and it was, it was quite fun to watch. The pup would oftentimes just be kind of waiting 
for the, there were only three adults, waiting for the adults to get back. It would sit on the edge there of the lip of the den, lay down with his head and his paws, eyes open and just watching the world go by. I have like hours of video of the pup just doing that, just watching everything go by. So this was the pack that I spent the most time with. Um, give you a little bit of introduction to who they are. This is the uh, dominant male, the alpha male. I had to name them all, which was, felt weird to me to like name wild animals, but uh, numbers, that doesn't make sense. And I feel like with storytelling and characters, you, you have to have names. So I went with descriptive names. His name was Clean Coat. He had the clean coat. He was very dapper, all white. This was his mate, the female. She was the matriarch. Uh, called her White Scarf. Yeah, she's got a little bit of a white ruff around there. These are two sisters. This one was easy because she had a turned eye from probably getting smashed by the prey animal, musk oxen, so called her one eye. Her sister here is bright eyes. She had kind of brighter amber eyes. They were about uh, two or three years old at the time. And then these two here, these little shaggy ones, these are the yearlings, they're one-year-olds. This was Slenderfoot, she was a female. And then this was Gray Mane. So just the descriptive names, just, just had to have a little bit of context here for who they are. Uh, and then the four pups, and I didn't name them. They were just pups, and I only could tell a few of them apart. There was one bigger male who was maybe 20% larger than the other ones, but the rest of them were kind of hard to tell apart. And I'll, uh, I'll let them introduce themselves here with a little bit of video. And so the name of this pack was the Polygon Pack uh, because of these very unique polygon ponds that are formed only in the Arctic. It takes thousands of years of permafrost soil freezing and thawing to create these structures that are really unique and only found in the Arctic. And it's this dominant landscape that um, their den was just above this site. So it was an easy name for them, the Polygon Pack. And so I thought it'd be fun to share with you videos and photos that were just from a single day. So this is, it's really actually over two days, but there's no nighttime there and I was following them the entire time. So we'll call it 40 hours in the day in the life of wolves. Um, so I'm gonna just share some video and some photos from that trip. Um, you know, they started off on this big kind of travel. There's an old saying that wolves feed themselves with their feet, so they are these coursing predators that move across the landscape and bump into the prey as they move. And so their main prey are these musk oxen. They're a really, really unique, interesting animal. They're more related to goats than anything else. Uh, the males can weigh about 700 pounds, and the females are about 500 pounds, but they are very adept at defending themselves against wolf attacks. And the way they do that is simply standing their ground, shoulder to shoulder, young ones in the middle, horns on the outside. And the wolves, most of the time, are not successful. They're only about 20% of the time are they successful. So they're testing these herds, and most of the hunts end like this, where the wolves are sent packing to go look for something else. So they bump into another herd here. This was another scene, just a photograph. This is getting into um, late August, early September, starting to get some of that twilight uh, that I hadn't seen for months and months. The first sunset was August 29th, so I've been up there at this time. I've been up there since June, and the sun's just doing this. So as a photographer, we kind of live for those twilight uh, and, and, you know, the golden hour, they say, of light, where it's beautiful low light, and you're able to create these really interesting backlit images. You can imagine going two months without any of that, and then it finally comes, and you basically lose your mind, you don't sleep for days, and you follow the wolves. So this particular day, they, they brought the pups along. The pups were about 12 weeks old. They're kind of in safari mode, where they're able to travel and keep up with the, the pack for the most part, and they could do maybe 20 to 30 mile days. 
And so they were along, which is an important time, because they need to learn. Wolves are born like humans with kind of these evolutionary characteristics and traits that allow us to hunt and exploit different things in different landscapes. But it has to be learned. You can't just drop a kid into the jungle and expect them to figure it out, or vice versa around here. And same with wolves. So an example is, in this pack, Greymane, who is that yearling, um, he was in the lower right hand of that kind of collage of the family. He was the largest wolf by body size. He was maybe, I'd say probably a little over 100 pounds. But he didn't know how to hunt. So like during the hunts, he would throw his giant body in there and like pinball up against the other wolves and was making more of a mess than he was being useful. And that was because he was only a year old and he hadn't actually learned yet how to properly hunt this animal. And by the time he was two, I was just up there. He's five years old now, and he is a very proficient hunter by now. But he had to learn it. So again, they traveled a bit. They bumped into some other muskox in. They tested them. And they take a nap. So they sleep. Um, they could sleep, I think, this particular time. They slept for about six hours. And then they're up again. They're traveling. They're moving. They're looking for food. They're hitting all these kind of marking sites, these signposts, I'd call them. And they bump into this herd of musk oxen, which, as you can see, the goat behavior comes into play, where they kind of go to this higher ground and the rocks, and the wolves went on their way. And this wasn't a good group to try to test. So they go down by the coastline, and they start traveling along the coastline, this beautiful fjord in the background. They found another herd of musk oxen. They decided to test this herd. It's kind of what the wolves are trying to do is create that chaos and spread the herd and try to get a calf to break off. But the big males in the herd are very strong, and the wolves respect that. Um, these big males, they don't have to be in the line of musk oxen. They can be outside of it because the wolves can't take them down. And this is during the breeding season for musk oxen, late August, so the big males all have their harems, and so they are the strongest of the group. I'll let this one just play with the audio. So you can see how dangerous it can be uh, to try and hunt these animals. Uh, that was the female Bright Eyes. She was about two years old when she got hit there. She was fine. She kind of just rolled out of it, and they, she kept going on with the pack. I just saw her this past summer. She's the leader of the pack, and um, she's the best hunter of the whole pack now. She's really experienced. She's probably six years old. But uh, in Yellowstone, 15% um, of wolf mortality inside the park is from prey. It's from getting kicked by elk or bison. So it's, it's a risky game. You know, if you think about it, canines, the reason, one of the reasons they have to live in these packs is because it's a bit harder for them to take animals down than like cougars. They can hunt and take an elk down. A big male cougar can take an elk down by itself. They can jump on it or ambush it, and you know, they have claws and big extremities and teeth, whereas wolves just have to put their face in the danger zone every time they want to get food. So they keep traveling. Again, I mentioned these kind of signposts. They check stuff out that's interesting on the landscape. These are old kill sites. This is an old bull skull, and the bull skulls weigh about 40 to 50 pounds, and they can't pick it up and move it, and they can't chew it. They do chew the, the nose off of it, but they can't chew the rest of it. 
And so this skull just ends up living on the landscape, staying there. And sometimes you come across you know, flat tundra and there'd be this, this weird little bump of grass that was like this tall, just a little tuft. And it's all beautiful flowers around it and it's really lush and it's brown all around it. And you go up to it and there'd be just like a horn sticking out. And you realize what that is, is that's probably hundreds of years of a skull being there and these wolves come by and they mark it, they urinate and defecate on it. Other wolves do the same thing, foxes do the same thing and it becomes this little fertilized, verdant, ground that is kind of cultivated by these wolves and it was it was always this surprise i loved it when i find these across the landscape so they again they were on the same day or maybe in the hour 36 or something like that let's say they bump into this big male musk oxen and so these big males they can be by themselves they don't even need a herd he maybe have just lost a big battle to try to get some females and they surrounded him and then in about 30 seconds, they were like, no way. This, this guy is completely, has everything together. There's no limp. There's no stiffness. We're just, we're going to leave this be because it would be too much of a risk. Check out another signpost. This is another one of those skulls in the landscape, a little fresher there. This is probably maybe a year old or so with some hides still left over. They decided to maybe try out some easier prey. Uh, these are Arctic hares, which maybe make up about 10% of their diet. But these things are like 10 to 15 pounds. This is a pretty big hair. And they're much quicker than the wolves, but they still put the effort and they still try. A lot of running goes on, and then eventually they, they do get one. But they haven't eaten in, I think, four days. Um, so they're all very hungry. They're trying to get the male here to regurgitate his little scrap. But you can imagine 10 pounds for six adults and four pups doesn't go very far. They started to play a little bit. This was kind of a funny scene where they're playing with the clean coat, who is the, the older male. He's kind of letting them beat up on him as a way to relieve some stress and have some fun. So then they move up into this, this higher terrain. So they went from sea level, and now they're moving up into, it's about 2,000 feet above sea level. It's kind of this rocky ridge line on the island that was part of their territory. And I was confused why they were going up there, because there's no musk oxen. It's too high for them. And Bright Eyes here, this is the, the female who's, who's now a really good huntress and leads the pack. Um, she's scoping out, looking for something. I don't really know what. Um, so I, I stick with them. They go higher and higher. Um, and I'll leave you with this um, audio as well. The audio here is by a, a Nupiak singer named Tanya Tagak, who's an Inuit woman. But here's what they're going for. So the wolves eventually give up because, as you can see, the hares can outrun them, and the hares do that behavior where they go uphill, and it makes it harder for the wolves to catch up to them. But it's worth a try, right? Looking at 50-plus hares, might as well make a run at them. <laughs> so they keep climbing up this, this slope. They're going higher and higher, and they get to this pass. They, they crest over, you know, it's 2,300 feet or so above sea level. They crest over it. They go down this kind of narrow chute, and the background there is kind of the core of their territory. That's where they normally hang out. It's this big basin. And they all go 
down over this little drainage, it's kind of like this little chute, and I go up to follow on foot, I've been following them on a four-wheeler up to this point, and I go to try to get another view of them, and I realize it's all ice. And I slip, fall, slide into some rocks, catch myself, realize that this is a terrible idea, and I need to go back. And then I'm thinking, what happened to all the wolves? I mean, there's no way, they don't have crampons, they don't, I mean, did they just all wipe out and go down this chute? And so it took me, it took me about two hours, um, and I'm worrying, kind of thinking this whole time, was this the last time that I, I saw these wolves, and, and how am I going to get around to them? A couple hours around, I get to a view where this is where the previous photos were taken, is that little notch, and I see these wolf tracks. These are wolf tracks, these are wolf tracks, and they're just kind of sliding their way down. But still, I'm like, is, are they just piled up down at the bottom here? I still don't know what's going on. And so I finally get down to the bottom, I see some more tracks, I come around the corner, they're all sleeping, they're totally fine. This was just, to them, this was just another day, looking for food, um, and you know, touring around their home range. The pups were absolutely exhausted, um, but it was, yeah, just a, an amazing window into the you know, two days of these wolves' lives. That's all I have, but we can do Q&A. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Yes? Yeah, what do they eat? If they can't get hairs and they can't get musk oxen, um, there, there is a low population of a small um, caribou species called a piri caribou. They're maybe like 150 pounds. They're pretty small. I've never actually seen one, but I'd occasionally see... Um, you know, like a skull and vertebrae from them. So I think, I mean, their only option is to eat um, hair and musk oxen. You know, that, those are the only two options. So it's, it is a pretty narrow margin um, for prey. Life. Yes. Oh, Mike. Life expectancy? Life expectancy, um, six is the average, five to six years, similar to Yellowstone. Yep. Yeah, it's pretty short when you think about it. Um, the oldest wolf in Yellowstone was 12, so it's possible. Um, I think the oldest wolf that Dave Meech recorded in the 90s on Ellesmere, I think was a 10-year-old female. He came back 10 years in a row and she was still with the pack. Yeah, there was one in the back. Did you say that was the only pack up there? Uh, there's a, a rough estimate that there's 200 wolves in the high Arctic, which is between Ellesmere Island in Greenland, and so the, on the peninsula, the Foshine Peninsula, I'd conservatively say there's probably eight packs. Um, I know of five or six myself, and then assume that there's others as well, just from wolves that I've seen but don't recognize. Mm -hmm. Sure. <coughs> Yeah, the pack was unknown. There, there had, so there was Dave Beach, the biologist, who went up there, I think, gosh, he went up there in the late 80s, and then his last trip was maybe 2007. And after that, there was another biologist named Dan McNulty who went up there maybe four or five times. But the pack that I followed, the Polygon pack, they hadn't been researched and nobody knew anything about their kind of pack composition. So it's... You can tell the yearlings just by how scruffy they are and the guard hairs that come up off their back. You can see it in Yellowstone too, a whole pack. You'll see a bunch that are scruffier is kind of the easiest way with long guard hairs that come up off of their, their, um, their hackles. And then their skull size proportion to their body size is another way you can differentiate pretty quickly between a yearling or also between males and females. Um, and then I was just doing a lot of guesswork based on you know, the two older individuals, and then pups, yearlings, and then the two females that were, they had to have been at least two or three years old. Yeah, so it's just kind of a lot of guesswork when it comes down to that part of it. Yeah? Are there, are there animals up there that prey on them? 
Uh, the only animal that would prey on them would be other wolves, and then there are polar bears. Polar bears? Yep. Yep, but I've, I've never seen one in my life and, and have seen tracks up there. I'm sure they overlap, which is something that haunts my mind that I'd love to see one day. Um, you know, I, I envision like a whale carcass or something on the beach that you see in, in other parts of the world where it's just a bunch of polar bears or grizzly bears on it. But I, I'm sure that they interact. Um, I'd be curious to see. Yeah. Yeah, the wolves in the Great Yellowstone ecosystem, they, they do really well. There's plenty of food. I mean, the, there's ample food in Montana where I live. Um, the state numbers for elk are 80% of the herds are at or above the projected levels of what they want. Um, and so mainly the issue is just what humans are going to tolerate. You know, Wyoming is a very, um, is a state that, doesn't have a lot of tolerance for wolves. They like to keep the numbers here down below 200. Um, and in Montana and Idaho, numbers were around 1,000, a um, little more in, in Idaho, about 15 to 1,600. And they want to drop those numbers down now by 90% in each state. Um, so that's... that's uh, I don't think it's based off of science. I think it's kind of a politicized issue, and I think it's... Um, unfortunate, and I, I say that I'm not a scientist, but those that I do know and the articles that I've read from scientists that have written to the Secretary of the Interior, Deb Holland, and, and other governors in those three states have asked for kind of a, a reevaluation of that. Um, I think you know, there's, they, they loosen the trapping laws in Montana a lot, which I think is kind of a step in the wrong direction. Good answer. Thank yeah, sure. <laughs> Yes. Um, first of all, thank you for this work that you're doing. It's absolutely sure. incredible. Thanks. Um, and I wonder if you would tell us a little bit about what it's like when you're up there for three months. What is your life like trying to do this work? Sure. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's the hardest place I've worked um, for for a few reasons. One, you know, the endless daylight is pretty rough just on your mind. Um, you've all of a sudden realized you've been up for 24 hours straight and it's been great and you're excited and fulfilled, but your body's also angry at you um, and it starts to make mistakes. I, so the first trip I went in 2016 for a month and that was a a much easier trip in that I didn't do much traveling on ATVs. It was mostly based at a den filming. And then 2018, I pitched this project and was funded, and I had an idea of doing it in a different way, so following the wolves as long as possible, camping out off the ATVs, and then coming back to base camp maybe once every five or six days. And that was great, and we got really nice footage, myself and another cameraman, um, but I destroyed my body. I had um, meniscus tears that I had to get surgery on when I got home from ATV accidents. Um, one of my knees locked up when I was out there, and it took me a couple minutes to figure out how to straighten it again. Um, and then, you know, it's you're camping, so it's all base camp style, expedition style, where you have all your foods. So we had 10,000 pounds of equipment. That's, you know, ATVs, fuel, you know, a generator for powering all this equipment that you have, um, and then a thousand pounds of food, I mean, all this, all this stuff. Um, so in that sense, it's, it was, that was pretty comfortable. Like it wasn't. It's, once you put in ATVs and five thousand pounds of fuel, you're like, well, yeah, I'll, I'll bring the comfortable blow-up thermarest, <laughs> not the like, you know, foam pad thing. Um, and so I went, ag I went again and just got back. So I was just there for the for the whole summer, the last three months or so, and I was um, much more restrained in my ATV riding um, and just, you know, took care of my body a bit more, did a lot more physical therapy leading up to it. Um, and so it was, uh, I came back, I don't need knee surgery, I'm doing great, feel good. So that's some maturity, I guess. <laughs> yeah, sure.
you feel that you have a connection with them. And, and you, I know you men, and you can tell the individuals from apart. Do you, uh, do you build a you know, rapport and an emotional connection with them? I mean, I certainly think about them and you know, they'll flash into my mind, you know, daily sometimes when I'm just down here or driving or something like that. I'll remember a situation. Um, I think about them when I'm there, worry about them, wonder what their lives are going to be like. Um, part of me is pretty envious of watching an animal for months at a time that is living exactly how it evolved to the point where they start to grow a winter coat when it starts to get cold. And I look, I kind of think of my life where I'm like, am I doing exactly what I evolved to do? <laughs> hmm. You know, as I'm driving down the road at, you know, 80 miles an hour. Um, so that part of it I think is interesting. And, and building a rapport with them, you know, as much as I, like I grew up with dogs, obviously had that interaction with my, my brother and his wolf dog, I, I felt pretty strongly about keeping, keeping some boundaries and not wanting to get like not wanting to pet, not wanting to like have them. I still, because even if they want to play, it would just be, a, it would be a nightmare, you know? Like if you play with a chimpanzee, they're gonna beat you up because they're, they're giant. Um, and if you can play with wolves, even though they're playing, they're gonna shred your clothes. That's, that's just how it's gonna go. Um, so I would avoid that. I, you know, I think that I was away for three years, just went back, saw a bunch of the same individuals they definitely had zero fear. I mean, they all came up right here, and it was like, okay, guys, let's, we gotta step back, hey, 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 you know, kind of set some boundaries, make them give space, that's kind of how I think of it. Um, they probably remember my smell, they probably remember the way I walk, um, but I don't know if they, they don't think about me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, um, yeah, I went to the University of New Hampshire, yep, and yeah, born and raised in Vermont, but, and I studied international business and economics, uh, and minored in environmental conservation, so, kind of did that, but yes, but yes, higher learning is important. I actually think about going back to school as well at some point here. Um, but this is amazing that you guys have this here, this resource. I've never been to Sheridan. This is an amazing art center, and college seems like it's great. Yeah. yeah I just, now you mentioned coming to Sheridan, I was just kind of curious um, how you came to speak to us tonight. I mean, I really liked your talk, and what brought you to Sheridan, I guess. Oh, sure. No, thanks. Um, so what brought me here was I am good friends with Brad Bauer, who's the executive director of the Sheridan Community Land Trust. I've known him since we both lived in Helena, which was, I don't know, eight years ago or something like that or more. And so I've, I've known Brad for a long time. I used to rent a room for him in um, Bozeman when he lived there in his house. And so he asked me to come, I think, two years ago. And then we've just been waiting for, for COVID to allow. So that's how, that's how I got connected here. Yeah, of course. Um, so you mean just being able to communicate today what I saw up there in a way that... Out there, mm -hmm. shooting, mm -hmm. and, you know, at least taking the professional technical end of what you do yep. and combine that and merge to achieve what you did. How was that balance out there for you? Oh, it's... Can you repeat the question? Me, oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, I'm just, I'm trying to, trying to get some clarity as well, sorry. <laughs> so, how, how did you merge your technical ability mm -hmm. to your ongoing experience with the wolves up there? 
Got it. Merge the, the yep. Yeah, so the question was, um, how did I merge kind of the, the technical experience that I have with the wolves there um, with the ability to follow them and to keep up and document them? And, you know, what kind of the, are the skill sets that combine to allow it to, to work? Um, it's funny. So, like, a lot of the, jo the job, I guess, as, like, a wildlife photographer or at least the type of work that I do is not related to photography at all. Like, there's all this other... I mean, I grew up in rural Vermont. My dad was an outward bound instructor, so we had kind of like an upbringing of just outdoor orienteering and being comfortable outside. Just, yeah, stuff that a lot of you here are familiar with. Um, and so that, like just being able to take care of yourself in the basic sense um, and, and doing that day after day for months at a time, that ends up being, surprisingly, a big part of the job is just getting to the place. There's all that, like, organizing the technical aspects, all this equipment, how much fuel do you need, what type of four-wheelers, how to fix, like all this stuff that's just kind of, kind of ridiculous outside of, you know, I always think of how much I need to follow the wolves, right? Like 10,000 pounds of stuff to follow an animal that doesn't have anything, has no things. <laughs> um, and so combining all of those elements, you know, there's the, to me, the, what I do is mostly just, I'm just documenting what's happening. You know, there's like creative artists that create concepts from scratch. They paint something that didn't exist. Whereas what I'm doing, I feel like, is just, I'm like a photojournalist documenting what is there. And my job is just to, just to be there, just to show up and do that. Hit the thing that makes the noise and captures the image. Sure. So this is for uh, planet Earth, right? Um, what I just showed you here is, was from a series called um, Kingdom of the White Wolf that's on Disney Plus that I've filmed for National Geographic. What I just did in the Arctic um, this last summer was for Planet Earth 3. So do you help with the narration then of what you're filming to put that into production? And then second part, do you hear like David Attenborough? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes, the amazing white wolf. <laughs> Thankfully, David Attenborough will narrate the Planet Earth series, so I don't have to think about that. Um, and then I did help with some of the narration on the National Geographic series, but we decided to, I was supposed to narrate the whole thing, but it felt kind of, it felt like too much, um, and they were female-led characters, so we found a female's voice, a presenter's voice, to work, um, and I think it worked a lot better. It's weird for me to be like a character uh, and to be on camera. I never wanted to go that route. I kind of, not so secretly anymore, but I use the TV to pay for this photo assignment. And they were like, could you be on camera? And I was like, oh yeah, I, I guess I could. You know, The magazine, National Graphic, doesn't have the budget that they used to, um, just the nature of print media now. And the television has big budgets. And so I initially pitched it to the magazine as like, let's do this Arctic Wolf story. And they said, yes, we can't pay for it. We walked across the hall and, you know, months of meetings and figured out something with television. So, yeah, it's still strange. But I'm, I embrace it as a, as a tool to communicate the work. And that's, that's why I do it, <laughs> able to do it. Yeah, um, so the challenges in the Arctic are, you know, it, it's changing faster than anywhere else on Earth as a re result of climate change. And um, there was actually an event that I w was, you know, happened to be there for that was a direct result of that this past summer where I started noticing uh, dead musk oxen just on the landscape that were whole, untouched, they hadn't died from a predation event, they died from something else, a disease or, disease or a pathogen or something else. So found a couple, okay, that's you know, interesting but not alarming, and then started to find more, and the count got up to 20 over the course of a few days, spread out, this is a bigger area, you know, maybe 15, 20 square miles. But I messaged a biologist um, in Calgary named Susan Coots, who researches this sort of thing, these, these pathogens, and 
She was very alarmed, and she, which was very hard to do, she got uh, resources and came up. She said, I need to be there, I need to sample it. You know, I offered, I was like, you could tell me what you need sampled, um, and I can do my best to, to do that. I've done necropsies in the past. I realized when she came up there why she didn't have me do that. She came up in a full hazmat suit um, and started doing these necropsies on these, these dead muskox in all age classes, calves up to adults, bulls, healthy animals, she said, lots of fat, lots of liver fat, lots of back strap, fat, or fat along the spine. Um, and I just had a call with her last week. It is, um, I don't even pretend to be able to say the bacterial name, but it's a, a naturally existing bacteria on the landscape that, is, that has had these outbreaks. Um, further south in the Canadian Arctic, there's an island called Banks Island where they've had tens of thousands, upwards of 30, 40,000 muskoxen that have died over the course of a few years from this same bacteria. On this island, where I would do this work, there's only 8,000 muskoxen on the entire island. And it's never, this bacteria has never been recorded this far north. Um, it affects fish, it affects birds, it affects mammals. It can be transmitted through the water. Humans can get it. Um, and she obviously was very alarmed by it and the ability to come up there, and she's working on writing it up in a publication now. So that's kind of the most immediate, I guess, effect that I see um, in the Arctic that, you know, it's a question that I get in these talks sometimes. People ask, like, what, do you see climate change? And before this, it was hard to, act, you know, to pinpoint, okay, yes, this is exactly what, what I see in climate change, but this was a very clear event that is unfortunately happening more and more. Um, there's also an example in uh, eastern Kazakhstan and in western Mongolia with a species of antelope called saiga antelope, and they were finding tens of thousands of those animals that had died, and they figured out that it was a naturally existing bacteria in their micro gut biome that was flaring up as a result of climate change affecting the grass that they eat and affecting the bacteria in their gut, which is fairly unnerving um, to think about that. So it's, with the wolves there, I mean, if, if this pathogen continues, this is the first time it's been detected on that island. It's supposed to go through several year cycles, uh, it, meaning that it continues for several years. Um, I'm not really sure what, what will happen in, with the wolves. Yeah. Yeah, um, you know, wolves can go, you know, they could go a couple of weeks, let's say, without eating anything, but they can generally find something, and whether that's bone that they can crush up and, and get, you know, digest it a little bit and get some fats and lipids out of it, um, that's something that they are able to do. I mean, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty amazing. It's, it is such a harsh environment for me to think about. There's few landscapes where you kind of look out and you're like, I could never live here. I have no idea how to make a living here without all the things. You know, I could kind of conceptualize that ability in the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem. I wouldn't survive very long, but like in my mind, I'd be like, okay, you need shelter, you, need, you do that, you have trees, you have all that stuff. Up there, you don't have fire, and I don't understand how to live without fire. Um, people that live there did have fire because they killed whales. Um, but... Um, Wolves, they, you know, they can go a couple weeks without food. I say the biggest threat you know, is, gonna, is humans, whether it's climate change related or, or directly by humans. You know, I worry that people want to go up there and hunt the wolves because you could, uh, I guess, um, not to give anyone any ideas. It's very hard to get there. It's very expensive. <laughs> but um, you know, I worry about that. Um, but yeah, I think, I think climate change is the biggest threat to them. It's indirect, but it's human caused. Yep. Um, I think that, you know, going back to that point of watching an animal for so long, living exactly how it evolved, it, it keeps coming back to me in, in, in everything, in just like when they play, how they socialize, when they do the big pack rally where they're basically all hugging and dancing together and singing and howling and um, having a good time, releasing dopamine, feeling good, all of these behaviors that that function up to this very intense, pivotal moment in their life when they have to put themselves at risk to find food, when they have to grab onto an animal that weighs like five to 10 times their body weight. So all of those behaviors that lead up to that, 
I find it to be really interesting and in, in trying to think about it in my own life where you know, socializing, family connection, you know, the community elements, staying physically healthy, getting enough sleep, playing, being, you know, being silly, like stuff that, I don't know, sounds very simple, very baseline stuff, but it's, it, I find it easy for me to forget those things sometimes, you know, when I'm oriented or thinking about something else or always trying to, you know, just read or do something else that's distracting from socializing. Like we should just play all the time. The balance, yeah, I think that learning from them a balance in life, yeah, I think that's a good, a good way to think about it. Yeah, I mean, we can take some more questions or I'm happy to do whatever, yeah. And you guys, anyone can leave any time. <laughs> if, you, if you gotta go, it's late, um, but I'm happy to take more questions, sure. Yeah. Uh, so this, so the the last time I was out there this past summer, we had five four wheelers. We had these um, Honda 500 Foremans, what they were. We had skid plates on them. We had winches. We had reinforced racks because we carry a lot of equipment um, and anchors. <laughs> we had boat anchors to get yourself out of tricky situations. Um, and then in 2000. 18, we only had two of the bigger ATVs, 500s, and we had like 300cc ATV, one as like a backup that wasn't very useful as a backup. And those ATVs, we just destroyed them. I mean, it was, I broke the frame on mine in 12 places, um, which was a combination of like hitting rocks, hitting things underneath, but then realizing too that it was you know, too much weight on the front and back, and so it was like twisting the whole frame. So basically, you know, the chassis was just breaking itself. It actually ended up being pretty comfortable towards the end, because it would kind of like snake over things. <laughs> but it was only being held together by like the drivetrain and the plastic, so it wasn't, wasn't really sustainable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's planes. Oh, it's super expensive. Yeah, it's absurd. Yeah. No, it's, it makes your head explode. Yeah. Yeah, I'm up here talking about climate change, and then it's like, well, wait a second. How did you get up there? Yeah, totally. I'm, the contradictions are vast. Um, so, yeah, we used planes to get all this stuff up there to begin with, um, and then w there's a helicopter that was, we had access to that then long lines everything out. So you put everything in a big net, and then you, you take it out. Um, you know, maybe 60, 70 miles or more away from kind of the, the main airstrip where you can land a big plane. Yeah, it's so much stuff. I mean, that's, again, keep thinking like, geez, just trying to keep up with these wolves. Oh, yeah. Only thing, and then I have to have all this stuff. Yeah, because... Uh, pilot from Bering Air in the crowd. Oh, great, yeah. Flags you over to Bighorn Airways to meet the other six pilots that he spent years up in the Arctic. Oh, that'd be great. Oh, I'd love to talk to them. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, Ken Borak is the main company that we work with. Yeah. They do everything from, from way up there all the way down to flying twin otters on floats in the Maldives Islands. Yeah, and they go to Antarctica too in the off season, yeah. which is wild. Yeah, that's, that's wild to think of a twin that's otter in like. I, I haven't gotten to that Arctic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've spent plenty of time up on the on the north. Oh, cool. Now the wolves up north on, in the Pacific or uh, up on the northwest. Um, three years in Kotzku. Servicing all of Northwest. Mm. Um, oh, that's a cool country. And then taking stuff over, spending time in Arctic Squad and so on and so on. Yeah, you're way out there. Huh? The, the wolves that we had kind of in our tundra area, that maybe it was the way the permafrost was, we had a lot of rodents. Mm. Yeah, lemmings? That fed the, fed the wolves. Yeah. Isn't that wild? I don't understand how they make it. We, we would find in the summertime some of their nests, the lemming, like, you know, we, we, you can find around here with um, uh, meadow voles and such, where it's just be like a, it's amazing. We'll just have this whole grass ball and there'll be some, you know, like some eider down in there or something ridiculous that they found. Yeah. But then you'd see, so you'd see the, the, the wolves take a few running steps and then die head first. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he's lost his marbles, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Pretty good snack. Yeah, the lemmings go through these boom and bust cycles 
um, where you can literally just have, like, they'll be swarming the ground when you're just taking steps. And then five years later, they could be maybe just see one. Yeah, no, it's wild country. It's, it's cool you spent time there, yeah. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. So were, were the muskox afraid of you like the wolves were mm, not? Good question. Muskox are terrified of humans. Um, you know, their predators come from land, and that was always challenging um, from a filming standpoint because, so the wolves are trying to get the muskox into stampede, right? That's their goal is to try to, you know, sometimes the wolves would ambush the musk oxen. They'd be hunting into the wind. They would smell musk oxen out of sight, but they would smell them. And all of a sudden, be following the wolves, and they would just go into a dead sprint before they even see anything. And they're coming up over a rise, and they're trying to scatter a herd is what their hope is. And then they get, you know, they get them stampeding, and they can try to separate off a calf is usually what they're trying to do. So when you're trying to film and follow, yes, you want to be close, but you don't want to interfere with any of the action. You don't want to interfere with the behavior. And so it was always, a, you know, the wolves didn't care how close we were during a hunt, but we had to you know, keep maybe a quarter mile sometimes away from the muskox herds to allow the natural kind of dance to, to unfold. And I say that, but the one time when that changes is when the muskoxen are actually getting engaged by the wolves, meaning that there is a calf or an adult that has wolves on its hindquarters, then they will do whatever it takes. And so that's happened where you park, action starts occurring, the behavior starts happening, they start hunting, they separate off one, you start filming, and then that musk oxen drags the wolves to you and comes between the four-wheeler to get the wolves off of it, and it comes to you as kind of a safety zone. And then that's a, you know, that's kind of a, not a very good situation. And also, yeah, you kind of feel bad like getting on your four-wheeler and zooming off because the wolves then engage. Um, but it's, yeah, we shouldn't, it's a part of it. But yeah, it is interesting that they are very scared of, of humans. Um, they will rosette, you know, they will form that kind of circle and that wall to people, um, which made them very easy to hunt for early Inuit people that came across with dogs and spears because they would just rosette this herd and then launch projectiles and they'd get food pretty easy that way. Yeah. I'm just curious, you were there for three months, just you and another person? Did you um, each other? <laughs> no, no, thankfully, yeah. I mean, it, it's a good question because, like, you know, if you got to look to your colleagues and be like, do I want to be in a camping situation, relying on them for safety and all the things for three months. Um, yeah, thankfully, it's, you know, it's a good group of people. Um, one of the guys I was just up there with lives in Livingston, um, so I knew him before. And it is important. It's important who you're with with these experiences, uh, with anything, really. But it you know, can definitely change it, so thankfully, it's been good. We guys think a couple more questions? Yeah, well, this will be the last one. Okay. I'm really interested in your journey as a videographer and photographer. Can you touch on that? How that this is something you've had forever and how you ended up now here? Sure. Yeah, it's, um, it's going to take about 20 minutes. Um, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, it's, you know, the, the progression, I guess, is growing up. <laughs> maybe it is going to take 20 minutes. Um, growing up in kind of an outdoor like nature-centric upbringing um, and having that be kind of the foundation of where I feel most comfortable and what I cherish is those settings and those experiences. Um, so that's kind of the foundation and then trying to figure out how to apply that as an adult to some sort of job. And so I was doing wildlife biology where I was studying animals and wanted to do more in terms of communicating that science that I was doing. I felt like you know, scientific papers, unfortunately, don't get read by as many people as I would hope. Um, people could do a PhD dissertation and, you know, 10, 20 people read it, which is a shame. And then it's like a, someone pulls a headline out of it. Um, and I, I felt like I could 
with the skills, I guess, that I had with photography and film, I felt like I could help to communicate and elevate some of that research and, and try to help bring it to a wider audience and try to help with people you know, having a better understanding for, for someone's PhD or for someone's dissertation. Um, so what I do now, I, and I partner with a lot of researchers in a lot of work that I do, um, even with the Arctic Wolf work, partnering with researchers that, um, you know, the woman that came up this summer, um, and then previous trips up there with, with biologists who were doing work. And, you know, I think that um, you know, the connection to Nat Geo, it's, unfortunately, it's like very specific serendipitous events that occur, but I had kind of this foundation and this passion and this, this toolbox of things that I had learned over the years, whether it be photography or kind of the field craft or the outdoor skills or, you know, research, observation. Um, but yeah, it is, it, unfortunately, when people ask me that question, it's hard because it is like this literal one meeting in Uganda with this researcher is the connection to National Geographic. So you gotta go to Uganda. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Ronan. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Spectacular. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for coming out tonight. This is our first uh, in bloom. Uh, it only took two years to plan, so hopefully next year will be a little bit easier. Thank you for your generosity tonight. It was really, it's very touching. It's really an amazing community, and we really appreciate uh, how much you've supported the Cherokee Community Land Trust over the years. And uh, if you did uh, buy an auction item, pledge on the paddle race. Uh, you can make your payment outside uh, over in the box office, I should say, tonight. And uh, maybe we'll get Ronan down here again sometime. But thanks again. Have a nice evening. <laughs> Thank you.